happy Sabbath, everyone. It's um, nice to be with you today and hear everyone's voices. Let's um, open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together on your Sabbath day, even though we're not together in the flesh. We thank you for this technology that we can speak to each other across the miles. I pray for each one of my brothers and sisters. We thank you that we've been able to share some of our week with each other and some of the prayer requests, the trials, the challenges and the blessings that we've had. We pray that as we come together, you would knit our hearts one with another, that you would enable us in this time to share our thoughts and on these topics, to learn more about you and your work at this time. Please continue to give us a Sabbath blessing and help us, Lord, to focus on your word, on your principles now as we study together we ask now that your holy spirit would be our teacher and our guide and our comforter in jesus name amen amen so good morning again or oh, this might be good afternoon it's good afternoon now um i'm going to be talking about um the two horns basically the breaking of the two horns and one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I'm going over Elder Tess's material. So I'm just going to put that up there. So it's the breaking of the two horns. And I think something she's mentioned is that she wants to go back over the material that she shared since May 2020 last year when we had the increase of knowledge. And I've been going through some of the notes on those presentations. So this is actually taken from probably her 13th of June presentation, um, which she called, actually it's nothing to do with the title for this, and also her 20th of June, where she's talking about the two horns. And she uses that phrase, the breaking of the two horns. So when I say that, I want to try and make this interactive so that we can recap ourselves. What comes to mind when I say the breaking of the two horns? What does that mean? Anybody? What are these two horns? Republicanism and um, Protestantism. So Richard said Republicanism and Protestantism. Yeah. And so what are they related to? Oh, this is easy, but... Literally. Sorry, somebody speaking. Well, um, did it first come from, was it Revelation 13? Revelation 13? Okay, that's Leon. Yeah, what, what's that? Two horns like a lamb, but speaketh like a dragon. Right, so we get this phrase, two, these two horns from Revelation 13 that are on this second beast in Revelation 13. And we know as Adventists, that's America. And these two horns there are described as lamb-like. And so where do we get the fact that they're Republicanism and Protestantism? Where do we get that from, primarily? Ellen G. White. Ellen G. White, yeah. So from Ellen White, we get Ellen White quote from Great Controversy, where it's from else, elsewhere as well, about these two horns. So when we say the breaking of these two horns, what do we mean? That what they, rep what they originally represented is no longer, even though the horns still exist. So the horns exist, but the breaking of them, they no longer represent what they're supposed to represent. So if we're saying they represent Republicanism and Protestantism, in some way, those two things get change. They change shape. They look different. They're not... Um, Emma. Yeah, um, I, I, I think of it as they remain, but at least America, that lamb doesn't espouse to those horns anymore, those ideals. So it kind of like doesn't behave in a manner that's in accordance with those horns. So. And when we think of horns, what does horns symbolize to us? as a on prophetic level when, when when i say horns what do people think of do they think of a lamb when i say horns <laughs> initially is it like power power yeah. yeah so horns would be power or anything else leadership leadership yeah leadership power um I think initially we'd probably say kingdoms if we think of daniel seven we'd say that these are powers these are governments kingdoms these are powerful entities of rulership and leadership, which don't naturally, um, we don't naturally think of a lamb with horns, do we? We don't think of anything associating a, a lamb and horns together. This is a bit of a, 
a contradiction in a way. But here in Revelation 13, we see them described as, actually, it's a lamb-like beast, I think, isn't it? I don't know if the actual wording, I'm not in Revelation 13, but we, but I think Alan White uses the phrase lamb-like horn, um, horns, but we'll look at the, par the quote in a minute. But yeah, so there's something about these horns. That if we say it's power, that, that gives America its power. Its power is, is, is centered in republicanism and Protestantism. So when those two are broken, in essence, it's lost its power. America loses its power um, in some way on these two fronts. And, but I think it's, it's not power as in the world sees that as power. So I think it confronts us with our understanding of what makes a government powerful because this is alien to most kind of, um, perhaps most countries, perhaps it isn't now, but some country, a lot of countries still are not ruled on the on these principles of republicanism and Protestantism. That's not where they get their power from. Their power is from their military strength or from their, their dictator, from their, you know, this is not a normal um, source of power, republicanism and Protestantism. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. Right. So he does have two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. So these horns are lamb-like, yeah, but he speaks as a dragon. So there's this contradiction straight away with this beast that it's got this, you know, a lamb conjures up innocence, it gentle, soft, you know, a baby-like qualities, but the dragon is like fierce, powerful, attacking, aggressive. So there's some contradiction going on here now. So it's this, and we know that's a transition from having these two horns like a lamb into this power of a dragon. It should never have been that way. So let's start. So the reason we're looking at this is to see, initially when Elder Tess did this, she was going through the history of the Millerite time period and she was showing how, if we were to expect, so let's just write that up on the board. We have 1798 and we talk about 19, uh, sorry, 1850. And what do we mark 1850 as in this history? If we were going to do our way marks for the 144,000 line, what would we say 1850 was in the Millerite history? And then we have 1863. Sunday law. So yeah, we're going to mark that as a Sunday law. And we know that at the Sunday law, the power of these horns is broken. The breaking of the two horns occurs. We know that that's when it's fully kind of drunk the cup. It's, 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 it's apostatized and USA kind of falls at this point with the Sunday law, but that's a process. We know it's progressive, it's a process. So if in this history, this is correct that we would have had, this is the Sunday law and this is the close of probation. Um, where's that second comment? Close of probation? Yes, close of probation. That's close, close of probation. No, I think it's second coming, isn't it? It's close of probation 61. I think, does anybody clarify on that? Anyway, that's the end. Close of probation is 61. Yeah. 61, 61, yeah, okay, so we make that same come. If we make that the end of the line there, and we've got 61 close to probation in here, we know that by this time period anyway, these two horns would have been broken. We should have expected to see a dismantling of those horns in this time period. And so what does that look like? And if we see that progressive kind of, that progress of those two horns in this history, we should be able to make some parallels with our history about what happens with those two horns. So we've said that they are republicanism, and Protestantism. Well, we haven't. I mean, Ellen White has, but we just discussed it now. Republicanism and Protestantism. So I want us to flesh out a bit more about what that is, what they look like, what they are, so we can see, trace that progress in this history. So let's look at the quote. The, the quote from um, it's taken from 4SP. I've taken it from 4SP. I think it's worded slightly differently, but it's a similar quote to Great Controversy. 4SP. 277.1. So we're going to look at that. We're just going to use parable methodology to um, examine that quote first before we go into a bit of history of the Millerite movement. Now, I don't know how much time we're going to have today to, <clears throat> to do this, but I just thought this would be a worthwhile um, thing to do to look at this quote anyway, just to understand more about republicanism and Protestantism, what they are. So we're just going to read that and then we'll dissect it. So she's talking about that beast in Revelation 13. And she says, here is a striking figure of the rise and growth of our nation. 
and the lamb-like horns, emblems of innocence and gentleness, well represent the character of our government, as expressed in its two fundamental principles, republicanism and Protestantism. The Christian exiles who first fled to America sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance, and they determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. These principles are the secret of our power and prosperity as a nation. Millions from other lands have sought our shores, and the United States has risen to a place among the most powerful nations of the earth. So she brings out several things in here, and I think we can use uh, parable methodology to glean more of an understanding about what Protestantism and Republicanism are. So first of all, she talks about this being a striking figure of the rise and growth of our nation. So right there, we're told that America was rising and growing. So this is the USA, and it's rising and growing. And, and this is um, this picture is, is, is not stagnant. This is not um, um, a country that just exists. This is its government. This is the way it is. It's a, it's a, there's a growth process taking place. It's forming and it's living and it's progressive. And I think that's what I get out of it is this is a progressive work that's going on with the US because it's a new nation. It's coming out of the earth. It's not got a history and it, it's got a chance to rewrite history really to start from scratch and build something up and so this is a rising growing progressive nature of the usa at this time um because even at this time it isn't the united states at this point but it's america this land of america where there's these now these all these people are going to come and they're going to start this system of government they're going to it's going to be an example to the rest of the world of what can happen when something kind of starts afresh and and in the, in the right way hopefully but um so it's not an established nation it's not a it's not already formed and set in its its ways of thinking and its ideas it's rising and growing and then she says and the lamb like horns emblems of innocence and gentleness well represent the character of our government as expressed in its two fundamental principles republicanism and protestantism so with this it's a figure anyway so right there we're in parable teaching because this is a figure of the or a parable or a picture of the USA and how it comes to power. But what parable techniques are we going to see in this next sentence? Yeah, should I pick on people? Cedri, what, what would you see? What parable methodology would you see in the next sentence? Um, which one is the next sentence? And the lamb, oh, like, the one that starts the lamb like horns, emblems of lamb like horns emblems of innocence and gentleness oh, and well the lamb -like horn. emblems of innocence yeah. and gents well represent the character of a government as expressed in its own its two fundamental principles so what was your question so the question is what parable methodology can we see here so we've got you know we know alpha and omega compare and contrast repeat and enlarge all the ones that we use what would you see here what would you want to focus on in this um, sentence um, it's is it repeating and enlarging? Yeah. And would you say com and and compare and contrasting as well? Yes, compare and contrast too. So what's 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 being compared and contrasted? Um, what's being compared and contrasted is the lamb-like horns, which is the innocence and gentleness. Okay, which... so first, yeah, she's giving qualities to these horns. So she's saying this is what these horns symbolize okay. yeah. okay. Go on. Um, um, oh sorry so yeah let's put those towards so we've got two horns so we have these um i'm going to put it here because she's i'm about to do it for the minute but i'm going to just put it here first so we've got two horns and she says um the two lamb like horns emblems of innocence and gentleness so what's emblems mean um like badges or uh, a symbol a symbol yeah symbols symbol. So she's, she's now saying that these horns are symbols of innocence and gentleness. Um, and so that, and then what does she say? Uh, she's which represent the character 
of our of the government um, of what she's saying there now she's it it so uh, the the gentleness and the innocence represent the character of the government right so these are symbols of the character of the government so the character of the government looks like this and then she goes on to say what does she say next as expressed in its two fundamental principles, republicanism and protestantism. So this government is made up of two fundamental principles. And what are those two principles? Republicanism and, and protestantism. Yeah, protestantism. Protest. So she, 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 she does, so, so this is comparing and contrasting, but it, you said repeat and enlarge. So what is the repeat and enlarge then? If you can line it um, up the repeat and enlarge is, um, the it's ex, yeah. yeah, the two horns. And she first tells us they symbolize innocence and gentleness. And yeah. what's the repeat and enlarge? What does she say now? Um, you mean in that same sentence? Yes. Because then she goes on to say, so she first she says they're emblems of innocence and gentleness. Well represent. represent. So now the horns themselves are emblems of this. So they're signs of this, but they also represent what? The character. The of character of the, the government. government. Yeah. As expressed. What's what, what does that mean? As expressed in the two fundamental principles. As displayed as uh, spoken as uh, come out as shown, acted yeah. as yeah. showed yeah so she's almost saying as shown or illustrated the same way kind of like symbols of of what of these two fundamental principles so she says these two principles are these two horns which are innocence and gentleness so where are we going to line them up now here if, we, if i was going to put equals here what would you put here and what would you put here um let me just come to the board say that again if you so, so we've got we've got innocence and gentle these two horns she says symbolize these two things and then they, she, she goes on to say they well represent what what well represent emblems of, of innocence and gentleness the horns are and they well yeah. represent the character of our government as expressed in these two fundamental principles so these well represent the character of the government because when i first asked this question at the beginning I said, what do the two horns represent? And Richard said republicanism and Protestantism. But here she says innocence and gentleness. But then she goes on to talk about republicanism and Protestantism. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't go straight from horns to republicanism and Protestantism here. We've got this middle bit of these right. characters. Right, so that's enlarging upon what the horns are. Right, so if we were going to say the horns are these two things, they're also these two things. Which one do you want to put where? So she says... Um, Emblems of innocence and gentleness well represent the character of our government. So this is the character of our government. They, they represent the character of the government. So the government is innocent and gentle in some way. Then she goes on to say that the government is based on two principles, republicanism and Protestantism. And so right. we can now line them up here. So which one should we put here? And which one should we put here? Uh, republicanism. So which one's is, republicanism? Is the um, innocence. Okay, so it's republicanism. And Protestantism here? Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to put it up here. That we can say that another best, another sort of repeat and enlarge of republicanism is innocence. And if I'd asked you what is republicanism, I don't know if anyone would have said innocence. <laughs> No, no, it's no. Uh, and so using parallel methodology, we've just got that republicanism is innocence and Protestantism is gentleness. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we would have said that either. So we can yeah. see how this, this is a powerful tool because she's going to go on to expound a little bit more about what this character of the government. So this is the, I'll leave that there, but that's up there now. So what parallel methodology can do for us to open up what we're looking for when we, when we say republicanism and Protestantism is this innocence and gentleness. And you think, okay, so how does that equate to republicanism and Protestantism? Let's look at the definition of innocence. It says a lack of guile, corruption, malice, um, or it's a state of purity. 
the state or quality or act of being innocent of a crime or other offence. So innocence implies that they're not guilty of crime, that they're not corrupt, there's no guile, there's no malice. So we could put that down, um, maybe, let's put this here, no corruption, uh, no guile, malice, uh, guilt, uh, not guilty of crimes. And then we can put here pure, so it is pure. And then Protestantism, gentleness is the quality of being kind, tender, mild mannered. So it's kind, tender, uh, mild mannered. And humane as well. I thought humane was very interesting because humane means having or showing compassion or benevolence, kind hearted. Compassion. And to me, that brings up empathy. I'm just going to put empathy there in brackets. So, so we could apply these to people, but she's applying this to the government of America. And she's saying these two principles, republicanism and Protestantism, can be symbolized by two horns, which can also be symbols of innocence and gentleness. So we're lining up republicanism with innocence and Protestantism with gentleness. And we find out that republicanism should have been had these qualities to it. This is the qualities that we would expect to see in a Republican government. No corruption, no guile, no malice, because the government has this quality. Not guilty of crimes, it's pure. And the Protestantism or the nature of Protestantism in the country and is gentleness. It should have been kind, tender, mild, married, humane, having or showing compassion or empathy on others, the way it treats its people. And to me, that would imply equality in that this showing compassion and empathy would be to all people, regardless of race, color, gender, etc. So right there in the heart of this government is these principles of, of what we would say were true Christianity, but in her wording, it's republicanism and Protestantism. Let's go on to see the contrasting picture of that. Let's read the next sentence. Somebody read the next sentence. Who should we do? Debbie, do you want to do the next sentence? If you read it and then we'll break it down. Yeah, innocence, freedom from any quality that, yeah, sorry, Richard put a definition of innocence, freedom from any quality that can injure. That's Amen. nice as well. Maybe we, should, maybe we should put that up there. Sorry, yeah, does somebody, sorry, did anyone want to make a comment before we move on? Freedom from any quality that can injure. Just wanted to know when, when that was, because I don't recall them being any of that at any stage in America. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is a good question. <laughs> yeah. Ever get started on that principle? I doubt it. I think that was the principle that, that was all originally founded off, but as we know, it seriously erred from the beginning. I think yeah. this is why we might mark 1798, because around this time, or just before that, obviously, in this time period, which we're going to look at, but way back, as you say, it didn't start out that way. And then by the time we get to 1798, the constitution is in place now. And that's what gives them these qualities. That's what tries to put this into place is the constitution. So before that, there is no constitution. They've still got some kind of government going on, but it's not, it's not. Um, so the constitution it's, it's itself is those and principles. Growing. And that's why it's rising and growing because it's not like that from the beginning, but it's coming out of that as all these people start settling and seeing how should we run this? And they're coming out of the dark ages, that, that whole process of, you know, coming out of Europe in the 1260, bringing them to this point in this time period is when this starts to be established or tries to be established, as you say. Sorry, Richard, what did you say? I was, I was just saying, so the constitution itself are those principles. I think I think that's why we would mark it in that, yeah, that where she talks about this, is that the principles yeah. were enshrined in the constitution. Yes. They followed through on, they should have grown even further. Yeah. Um, but that's what we could say is how they got, yeah. What those two horns were is this the constitution yes. of 
never work. I mean, it was never, there was never equality in the United States, maybe for some white people, but for the rest, um, for the natives and for a lot of people, um, the constitution was just, it never worked. It was a load of rubbish, really. It just no, didn't. The constitution of the North, not of the South. Yeah, but I think the principles We're... were there. Go on, somebody wants to speak. So, uh, yes. shouldn't Sorry, we... Chad, have... Sorry, Chad was speaking, I think. Sorry, I know there's two people talking at once. And, and then Cedric, go on, Brother Chad. Sorry. Yes, um, I think we're looking at it the incorrect way. We're looking at it through the eyes of an individual, but we have to look at it systematically. And systematically, it did, it did represent, um, in a sense, because it was comparing itself to the tyranny of the kings of um, Europe. These people escaped during the 1260. They escaped the flood. The land opened up and received them from the flood. So they were escaping not just the tyranny of Rome, but the tyranny of um, a monarchy. So now we have this new system of government that's growing just like a babe. That's why it was com it's comparable or it was compared to being innocent. It's not necessarily the behavior of the people, but the growth of the nation of itself and the principles which were new. It was bucking against this system of monarchy. So it was new. It was innocent in that sense. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's that process of those people unlearning and learning again that um, just like we're doing in the movement, just like, you know, we, we we set out their hearts are in the right place. They flee the tyranny, as you say. And I think the next sentence will give us that. And as we so look at that, I hope it'll answer the question because I know Natalie's asking that question really, was it ever that? And I think that's what we're going to see as we look at the line up to 1798. We see, was it that? Did it try to be that? And how did it fail to be that? How, why, how are these two horns being broken? I think that's what we want to trace, Republican and Protestantism. And it so the principles themselves were never, were never identified in the constitution or was there a few people who actually really comprehended those i think i think there were people that religious freedom i think there were people that did understand it as we know roger williams did understand it but they Just were a actually, handful but the majority yeah. didn't comprehend the depth of those principles in the constitution okay no and even those that were pushing for some of those principles didn't fully understand what they were pushing for you know say like someone like thomas jefferson who might have had a slave himself that understood still that people should have freedom so god's hand was over the forming of that writing that in that government that they should have those principles in there and they should have fully stood on them eventually but they didn't so it's that constant battle between them and how they interpret it it's just like the bible we know the principles in the bible are good ones but the way it's interpreted is you know makes it seem like they're not in there people don't live it the israelites are in rebellion you know it's not it's not lived out like it should have been um and i think that's similar with america Let's go to the next section. Um, one more oh, sorry, question, you have a point? Uh, Emma. Yeah, is uh, can you define? I mean, like uh, republicanism. The principle there is um, for the people, government, but for the people by the people, and protesting Protestantism, whatever. Uh, well, what 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 really is that? Okay, so I'm not going to define that now because what I want to do is get it from this paragraph. I'm going to use parable methodology to see what we can understand Protestantism and Republicanism to be from this paragraph. So, so far, because we've got preconceived ideas about what it is and what it isn't and what it should have been, but she's bringing out these principles for us to look for. And I think the first thing we've seen is this innocence and gentleness. So we've seen this is what it should have been, that there should have been no corruption, no guile no guilty of crimes, they should have been kind and tender and compassionate. And these are the principles the government should have enshrined in, 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 uh, as a governing body of how they were gonna rule their people. And then we're gonna see what the opposite of that was in the next sentence. So if we let, let Debbie do the next sentence, if you want to read that Debbie, and then tell me what you see parable methodologies going on there. The Christian exiles who first fled to America sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intoler intolerance. And they determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and relig religious liberty. So now she's going into a bit of the history of, mm. of, of America, because she's already stated mm. that um, the USA was rising and growing to power, progressive work, yeah. and it should have been based on these two principles. These are the two horns on it, and they represent these things. She's giving us that interpretation. And now what does she say in this next sentence? What, do we, what are you getting from it? Why did these, these uh, exiles flee to there in the first place? Yeah, well, she's saying that the Christian ex exiles who first fled to America, so she's saying 
uh, sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance. So she's saying there why America was, um, it says here, a striking figure of the rise and growth of our nation. So that's where it came out of the, the fact that it was it was a, a growing nation to house these Christian exile, exiles who um, sought asylum in America from royal oppression and priestly intolerance. So first of all, we learn we learn two things about the people that are fleeing. So they're coming from. It doesn't say here where they're coming from. It, it, well, it just says it exile. Says, so you, you assume that they're from other nations. So so from other nations, yeah. Okay. So the ex. So what's exile? So they're first of all they're Christian, and then secondly yeah. they're exiles. And, and what's an exile? Yeah. What, what would that? How would we define exile? I didn't really look that up, but how would you um, it's, it? it's like it, it's like you've been the country that they're I'm living like, in. They've been. Um, They've been well. It, it could mean that they've been. Um, there's a there's a law in their country where they've been told to flee. A bit like John. Told he to was leave. exiled to Patmos. You that sort of thing. Right. Or, or so some got kind a, of reason. If we if we um. Is it an exile someone who um, disagrees with the, the laws in uh, their country and has to flee because of persecution? Right. So this could have been put on them by, yeah. um, could have been told to leave, or they're, it's kind of voluntary exile. They're taught because the definition of exile is the state of being barred from one's native country, typically yeah. for political or punitive reasons, which means as a punishment or politically yeah. to expel or bar someone from their native country. And so they're basically being banished or deported or evicted um, through the circumstances that they've been under or because someone's told them to go. And we, we do have some pre-knowledge of the Dark Age. So we know here it's because there's something to do with their religion, Christian, that they're exiled. And they flee to America where they seek this asylum. So we can say that, that America was also uh, an asylum. And what's an asylum? A place of shelter, place of... protection. protection. Yeah, refuge. refuge. Refuge, safety. Yeah. So there's this, this idea of protection and refuge and safety, which we get with this word asylum. Yeah. So it's a safe place. Yeah. It's um, yeah. refuge, like you say, um, and that would go along with these principles we see here. That it's 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 all positive, in its um, should have been positive anyway. So these Christian exiles, and they flee for two reasons. What are the two reasons, Deb? Why they um, what they flee royal from? So royal, royal oppression, oppression and priestly intolerance. That was civil and religious. Okay, so wait a minute. Just you do the next bit. So, so Deb, so we see that they're fleeing for those two reasons, and yeah. they determined to establish a government, a government upon the broad foundation of what? Civil and religious liberty. So could we say, if we use compare and contrast, we say they're yeah. fleeing from this because this was the negative. Yeah. And what do they want to do instead? They want to have civil and religious liberty. So instead of royal oppression, they want what? If we do it in the order of the sentence, it says royal oh. oppression and priestly intolerance, civil and religious liberty. Which one are we going to put? With, so with, with royal oppression. So instead, instead of royal oppression, they want. So, sorry, did you say it? Um, so civil freedom. Liberty. Is it civil liberty or civil liberty? Yeah, civil right. Liberty. So, so from the sentence, we're going to say yeah. civil liberty, and another word. I think I just said another, one say freedom, another word for this freedom, and this one is religious. Freedom. Mm. Religious liberty, yeah. Religious liberty. Yeah. So, just using the parent contrast in that sentence, we see that they were going from royal oppression to, mm -hmm. and they wanted civil liberty. So, we see mm -hmm. the opposite of royal oppression here then is civil liberty, and the opposite of priestly intolerance is religious liberty. So. Right there we see church and state there. We see state with royal oppression, yeah. the kings of Europe, this oppression, and then priestly intolerance. Or, and, and, the, and the flip side of that is religious liberty. So if we bring those three, those two things up to here, what are we going to put here then? So they want a government based on republicanism and Protestantism, which is the opposite of what they fled from. So they don't want royal oppression here, and they don't want priestly intolerance here, but they want... They want here, what do they want? So Republicanism is 
Civil liberty. Yeah, only the one is religious liberty. And religious liberty. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, and the opposite of that, so the opposite of innocence is what? What's the opposite of innocence? Using this structure and this sentence, what's the opposite? Corrupted. Per, cor yeah. use, the, use these words in the sentence. So we can use the words of the sentence. What's the opposite yeah. of innocence? Uh, oppression. Oppression, yeah. So that if we don't have an innocent government, we have an oppressive government. Oppression. And what's the opposite of gentleness? If you don't have a gentle government, you have an in intolerant one, yeah? Yeah. Intolerant. And I think that's quite significant when it comes to individual Christianity and, and you know, proper principles of governance and, and also on a government level here. So we can see that royal oppression is the opposite of, of what we, of innocence. And when we think about that oppression, they've come from this, um, obviously the dark ages in Europe, but it wasn't just a religious thing, it was the state doing it too. And this state is these kings. And when you think about the opposite of what we set up here, that they're not guilty of crimes, then if there's an oppressive regime, they're guilty of crimes. And we have a phrase, crimes against humanity. And those crimes are defined as certain acts that are purposefully committed as part of a widespread or systemic policy, systematic policy, directed against civilians in times of war or peace, e.g. extermination, murder, enslavement, torture, imprisonment, rape, forced abortions, other sexual violence, persecution on political, religious, racial and gender grounds, the forcible transfer of populations, the enforced disappearance of persons. So all those things come under crimes against humanity. So this is what they're fleeing. They're fleeing oppression from governments who are doing these things. They exterminate, they murder, they torture, they imprison, they rape. And a lot of these kings, you know, if you didn't agree with them, you got killed off. It would, there was a very much a, a lawless kind of, uh, yeah, an oppressive regime which dictated however the government felt or the leader felt about people, that uh, people disappear, you know. And this is what we say about dictatorships now, oppressive regimes. They do all these kind of things and they get away with it. And that's what they're running from these crimes against humanity and then priestly intolerance if we look up the word intolerant it means an unwillingness to accept the views beliefs or behavior that differ from one's own bigotry narrow-mindedness so the, the general definition of intolerance is an unwillingness to accept someone else's beliefs so if we say that intolerant here and this is what we see on an individual level as well so when we have very strong fundamental um beliefs on something we have an unwillingness to accept someone else's viewpoint like we were conservative thinkers yes yes the catholic the catholics believed they had a divine right from god to control the consciences of men and, and this is yes but this but if we if we separate it from religious here it's priestly intolerance intolerance can look you know an unwillingness to accept someone else's what did it say? And one is to accept views, beliefs, or behavior. Accept someone else's viewpoint, beliefs, or behavior. So this doesn't just have to be religious. We're making it religious because we're going to say priestly intolerance is religious intolerance um, in this context. But obviously, intolerance on another level could be, you know, um, meat eaters can't stand vegetarians. I mean, you could do it on different lifestyle issues. You could do it on... Um, beliefs about different subjects it doesn't have to be you know like I love football and you hate it you know I, I don't tolerate this passion for football because I hate football you know those kind of we can have intolerance towards people with the way they behave that they snore they you know they have different uh, all sorts of things you can be intolerant on but in this context it's religious intolerance so we're not tolerant of another person's viewpoint or beliefs or behavior when it comes to religion so we we, we won't say like France I think it was that banished they're intolerant towards the the Muslims wearing the head covering, jihad, um, hibab, whatever it's called, sorry. So, so we can be, we can have religious persecution on that level, but we're intolerant of someone's viewpoint, their beliefs or their behaviour on lots of different things, but in this context, it's religious. So that's an act of denying the right of a person of another religious faith to practice or express their beliefs freely. So religious intolerance is like discrimination based on religion, basically. And that's how we, we know that it always leads to persecution. 
it denial of the rights of someone to practice and express their beliefs freely but when we see those principles we can see how they can be carried out to different religious groups different sorry different groups of people in society how they'll be they'll be treated um, in a way if this government doesn't agree with them makes laws against them So going back to our passage, this is what the Christian exiles were fleeing from. They were fleeing from this royal oppression, the basically persecution, religious intolerance. So they're not being treated in a good way. And they're determined to establish a government that's going to be the opposite of that. It's going to have civil and religious liberty. So when we think in terms of civil and religious liberty, what does, we've just kind of defined religious liberty. It's the ability to practice and express our beliefs freely. Um, obviously not at the expense of anybody else um but what's civil liberties what are civil liberties does anybody know when i say civil liberties what would you think of freedom of speech freedom of speech good yeah so we've got um let's put down so this is what we want from republicanism is civil liberty and liberty means freedom so this is uh freedom for the people civil liberty and it's freedom of speech. What else? Freedom of privacy. Freedom of privacy, yeah. Freedom of conscience, which is all about the great controversy. When we put action and speech there, freedom of action and speech. Freedom because of... you're talking about the behaviours, aren't you? Yeah, and I suppose freedom with action has to go within the law. So someone could say, well, I need to be free to kill someone, but freedom of conscience, Freedom of protection. protection. So, what would how would we define it? So, freedom of conscience, freedom of the press, actually, is also uh, part of speech. Freedom of the press. Um, you're, you're saying protection. Protection against what? Um, <clears throat> protection against harm. So, um, so Injustice. being protected by the law um, from. So murder. Um, yeah. Also, um, possession of the minority of their views. I think that's the, I think that's what Republic is: is that the the majority don't don't kind of overpower the minority. The minority still have protection. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. The right freedom to worship. Freedom of to worship. Yeah, now that comes under um, the Bill of Rights. Call that freedom of um, freedom of assembly which I think is probably, we need to put that in there. Maybe I should just, I'll just read it in there. Freedom of assembly, which is to worship on a religious level, but also to assemble to discuss anything you want to, some political thing. Um, so that could be worship. It doesn't have to be religious, but I want to hold a meeting, you know, tackling the government's taxation system or something, you know, and they say you're not allowed to discuss that. The, one of the main things they wanted was freedom of self-rule freedom of self-rule and of course what was that freedom of self-rule from whom from um kings um when we think about this are we thinking about it as how we're looking at it now or as how um the, the those people would look at it i was, you know? I was thinking in terms of what we're discussing here primarily so this is but I, so i don't know if they understand all these things this is i guess this is a definition of civil liberty we have today but when we look at it in these terms they want to start a government based on these principles so when they're thinking about it what are they thinking of so yes they're thinking of self-rule which is not being ruled by england i guess make primarily or, or, or just the king in general you know so they're okay, thinking so about self-rule they're they would be thinking about um by a king or another the, country let's put Yeah, sorry, did you finish? Um, my, I was as in the middle of a thought process. Yeah, but they'll definitely be thinking about self-rule and um, assembly is a very big point because historically, especially in Europe, if, if it is, would be illegal to assemble and speak negative about a king. So they needed that form of expression. And a, um, a big thing for them was expression. They, they wanted to be express, to express themselves and religious freedom would fall underneath that separately because there are different religions that escaped to the United States. So they wanted uh, uh, that freedom to not be Christian if they don't want to. Right, so freedom of religion for all. 
and that this was that this was a crucial thing that that obviously was evolving over time with them because they've come with a protestant mindset so they're christian and they want to make a government christian because they see the good principles behind christianity which should have been these things innocence um protestantism has treat people well <laughs> they understand some of it but um they're learning and growing in their experience about what this looks like so some of the other things that you can see is i guess it's similar to protection from harm which is the right to security and liberty so this is a uh, protection from harm the right to security so this is like having laws so if you're thinking about starting a country from scratch what laws you would have into security um to protect people against you know crime which is based on the last six i suppose you can't steal from someone you can't murder them you can't take their children those kind of things the right to equal treatment yes. under the law the right to a fair trial and the right to life so this is um the right to own land. Uh, yeah sorry, so, sorry to interrupt them yeah. you've got 20 minutes left okay equal treatment the right to own land under law yeah Yes, because you come to a country now that's not owned by anyone particularly. The right to own land. Now, who's going to own that land? Is it like, like capital, I think it's like capitalism. Sorry, go on. Would capitalism be um, part of that? So not just land, but just the ability to own things and to trade and to do what, what you want with them. Okay, so we're going to put possession. Capitalism would be birthed from that, yes, but it wouldn't like necessarily be that they're coming because of capitalism, but capitalism yeah. would be birthed from that. That's yeah. right. So it's the right to own land, possessions, property, which is similar to land. I mean, but a house on the land, you know, um, because some people would rent the house or, you know, it wasn't theirs. Property, right to vote. To defend oneself and the right to bodily integrity, which is interesting. Right to defend oneself. Yes, okay, so the right to vote. Uh, right to vote. So we can see that civil liberty, it, it does actually encompass quite a lot. And I think without really thinking about it, you think if you were going over there, uh, would you have considered all these things when you're thinking about governing, uh, a governing body? And how would you begin that process? How would you choose who governs people? Who's in power? And how do you give all these people these things if you want to maintain law and order and law and order based on morality? So you've got to imagine the, the, the mindset of these people going over there is, you know, we're Christian. We want to uphold Christian principles. We want morality in this. You know, we don't want people drinking. We don't want people killing. We don't want people doing those things that we've seen in these other countries and these other governments, these oppressive regimes. We don't want people to get away with that. So we're going to make laws that protect people and that make them Christian, I guess in some ways and so this is the problem they've got is this is this whole how to mesh church and state or how to get the principles um in there that are gonna <laughs> that's gonna protect everyone and for everyone's best interests and of course they're coming from a, a christian mindset so that's the the thing that they want to defend i am being denied my right to own land like i'm taking the government to court until i have a nice home with some land what are you saying tom <laughs> do you want to elaborate on that <laughs> No, I was just joking. I was just saying that part of this liberty is, is the right to own land, and it's, it's so difficult to own land nowadays. So I'll, I'll just say I'm going to I'm going to take the, the government to court until you give me nice much so because it's so expensive. As well. Yeah, so there's ways of, around denying people these rights without it looking as obvious. But um, and then it's, it goes on to say under this definition of civil liberty that many contemporary nations have a constitution or a bill of rights or similar constitutional documents that enumerate and seek to guarantee civil liberties. So this is why people get together, you know, the government's coding, the, the, the Bill of Rights, that most, a constitution of some kind, the European Convention on Human Rights, all these things that we have into play so that countries will agree that this is how we're going to treat people and this is what rights we're going to give them. And controversial examples are property rights, but they're also reproductive rights and civil marriage in our day and age. So the, the right to get married to who you want, the right to reproduce, the right to have children or to adopt children, all those things we see are coming into play in our history. So we can bear those in mind, but at this point, they're faced with this, having to start this new government based on these principles. And then Ellen White, just to finish that quote, Ellen White says, these principles are the secret of our power and prosperity as a nation. So these are the principles that are the secret of the power of America. 
that they should stand on innocence and civil liberty, gentleness and religious liberty. If they have those principles, then they'll be a powerful nation. That's what's going to give them power. And millions from other lands have sought our, sorry, these principles are the secret of our power and prosperity as a nation. So their power, their strength as a nation and their prosperity or their financial and economic position, how prosperous they would be, were dependent on them following these principles through. Millions from other lands have sought our shores and the United States has risen to a place among the most powerful nations of the earth. So because of those principles, many people from all sorts of exiles from different countries have pursued their dream by coming to America. Have sought so the shores. power... Go on. So, so the power is the, um, is the is the civil, like the government, um, and the prosperity is the principles that should have been revealed through Protestantism in you know, one's relation to God and one's relation to neighbor, the neighbor, if they were properly understood. You could probably split them like that, that these principles are the secret of our power and our prosperity as a nation, because those principles are both the secret of those, those two things. So whether we'd like, we'd say they both come under both. So you're going to be powerful, um, have a powerful state and a powerful government. Yeah. And a powerful, yeah. Church. Because that's not... That's not church per se in that in that example, because these are the principles of the government. So yeah. true Protestantism. I'm trying to, still trying to separate them. I know. Those two words, power and prosperity. Because we but see I... Protestantism as Christian religion, and that's not the principle of the government. So the government principle should have been this, the way we treat people. No, but the principles of the government. And empathy and compassion. And that's yeah, what but, but the, the principles, principles of, the of the government allow the principles, the true principles of the Ten Commandments to be manifested. So they yes. uphold those principles. If So if both parties got it right, the, the government, the civil power, would have upheld the principles being manifested through Protestantism, which is, you know, if you love thy neighbour as yourself and have your relationship with God, it is a prosperous um, thing. And I think this is where this is where the controversy comes into. I think it's a good point because it's we think that the government should have been Christian. And this Protestantism here doesn't mean Christian. And because the, the word Protestant came out of the fact they were protesting the tyranny of Rome. So they're protesting the church state relationship that Rome had to persecute people. And then they go over there with that Christian mindset saying we need to be Christian. And if they truly were Christ like, of course, like you're saying, it would work. But many protestants were not christ-like in that sense though they're christian mm. their christianity isn't um has become political and has become self-motivated and ambitious and all those things which were not the true principles of how to treat people equally so but true the government... liberty of conscience and true freedom from religion sorry just to finish that point is not is not having a christian government it's having a government that says yeah. we're going to give everyone the freedom to believe believe what they want and that's protesting tyranny and oppression go on and they could have upheld those principles without themselves being Christian and yes. allowed the Christian Protestants to manifest those principles and the government would have upheld them principles being kept. Well, like, in, you know, through the individual. So they would have protected them. They would have done their part as a government to protect them uh, so that they could freely continue to express those principles as they're manifested. Right. And the, but but the without the government they... personally being Christian. Sorry, without the, yeah, without the government being says, christian they understand that if freedom of religion to all is the principle that this government must be based yeah, on yeah that's, that's true and it isn't a it christian isn't government and this is the thing that i think that we're having warfare over today is that the, the american government should be christian and these christians have got this problem that they're coming from this catholic state of persecution you know the dark ages and they come over to america as christians and this is who they are and they're saying we want the government to be like us we want to run it how we want and who we are and protect our interests, which is how everybody thinks. So they come over and they say, we want a government based on the principles we believe in. And now the fear is that as other people come in who are a different religion or relig different color, different background, different language, how are we gonna protect our interests if they take over? So this is what, and, and of course, if you were truly trusting in God and you followed his principles, you wouldn't fear other people taking over. You'd see that this was the Amen. right thing to do. And some people had that vision. They saw it was the right thing to do, but others are driven by fear and not, and it, and it doesn't work then. So, but you can see from a human perspective how hard that would have been to go to a country and say, well, all us whites from England will stick together. All us whites from France will stick together. All us native Indians will stick together. All us, 
you know, ethnic uh, African Americans was that you can see how that you stick with your own group to protect your interests on a family level, on a national scale. So it is now they've got to get this government formed that's going to be kind of like how yeah. London is and how America is already. Yeah, like, cause... Quebec, all the French, and then you've got all the other different groups. But hopefully, they would have been all this live in harmony. Yes. If all the principles were followed through on, but it's a it's a big risk, isn't it? This is and this is a risk. I think. Um, I don't think uh, it could ever have worked while Satan's on this earth. It would never have, Constitution will never have worked. So this is just all about the great controversy with Satan and, uh, it, you know, God's people. Yeah, and this is the problem we've got from day one. How, is it, how was it going to work? Was it going to work when these people themselves are Christian? So they're going to want to defend the Christian faith. They're not going to want to defend an Islamic person or a Sikh person or anyone else person who's not the same viewpoint as them, or a, or a Catholic person, they've just come out of the Dark Ages, they're not going to want to give a Catholic their rights. So when lots of French Catholics come over, this is something I was looking at the French and Indian War, uh, French Jesuits come over and they're going, wait a minute, we don't want you people taking over because we're going to have a repeat of what's happened before. So you can understand somewhat their reticence to give anybody rights or power who's got a similar mindset or what they think is a similar mindset to the papacy and the Inquisition, but at the same time not re- recognizing they've carried some of that mindset with them because so, they are, they have been steeped in it go on so do you think it was an identity thing um that they in some way they didn't ki- kind of like quite leave behind because if they came into america looking for some kind of identity they and if it was a christian identity and they they're not really following those christian values but they class in everybody as um, if you're not part of this identity, then uh, you can't join us. I mean, whereas America represents freedom, isn't it? It did. I mean, in the beginning, freedom to, to choose and nobody could probably really define that identity. That's why it went all awry. Yeah. And this is the thing. They, I mean, this is a new experience. They've come out of this priestly oppression, sorry, priestly intolerance and royal oppression. They don't know what a good government's going to look like so we've got to try and form one now and make it work so let's base it on our principles let's make the people that hold office christian protestants and hopefully that will protect the state from getting corrupt you know because we'll have good christian people in there so you can see some of the workings of their mindset is that we don't know what this looks like let's try and form it properly to make it work so that we don't get in this situation again not recognizing that if we start enforcing our viewpoint a bit like us saying if we enforce the sabbath everything would go well if we just said to everyone you've got to keep sabbath um but not recognizing that the very principle of enforcing it on someone is violating the principle of the Sabbath, which is freedom to worship Christ for, by the dictates of your conscience, that it's a resting in Christ. It's a, it's a salvation. You know, it's a, it's, it's a hard thing because it's like, well, we think what's the perfect government going to look like. It's going to look like one that runs on the principles we believe in, which is, you know, this true Protestant doctrine. But the trouble with that is not all the Protestants were united on all their doctrine either. And so now you've got like, well, what do we believe about this? And if you're going to start persecuting people because they are not letting them have office because they have a different doctrinal position, you're doing exactly what we put up here, which was an unwillingness to accept someone else's views or behavior. So you're already going down priestly intolerance. If you start defining, everyone has to believe this way and they have to act this way. So it's like expression of free will within the confines of the, 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 the natural law, basically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, and that's to govern a group of people based on that go on yeah i was gonna say um i i think i think it, it could have worked but the only way it would work is that if everybody was in harmony the, with the same mindset if you imagine if you had like a colony full of roger williams yes you know then then it would have worked because he he understood it so i think it's just the fact that not everybody understood it yeah. um but at the same time i i would like to it's, it's very difficult. I, I think I'm, I'm really, uh, it's easy for us to look back and say like, oh yeah, you know, they had that same principle, but imagine you're, you're one of them, you've left religious and, and, and civil oppression, you've come to a new place, and imagine if people are coming in and you perceive that they're going to be a threat to that. So imagine if loads of um, Catholics came in, loads of papists came in, and they just established the same thing across everywhere. So you're in the same position as before. You know, you, you would think, okay, we need to protect that. Or if you have, you know, Muslims coming in and the 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 their the idea is to, 
you know, you, or what you think they're going to do is 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 instill um, Sharia law. They're going to do Sharia law. You could, not just you, but everybody else would lose their liberty and things like you know. You, I, I think I do sympathize with them in, in a sense that you know it, it's an easy it's an easy um, pit to fall into. It's a it's an yeah. it's, it's a very easy hole to fall into because you're thinking we want to establish this country on religious and civil liberty. But there's no one else who does religious and civil liberty apart from us. So we're the ones who have to be in power and protect yeah. that because right. nobody else will do it. So if anybody else comes, they're going to have to put civil civil oppression or religious oppression. So you, it's kind of it's very it's a very easy thing to see, and it's very it's very difficult to, to think differently from that. Um, I, I, I think I'd, I'd really I'd really I really do sympathize with with the course that they took and. Honestly, I think if I was in that same position, I'd have probably, I'd have probably taken the same course. I'd have been like, no, don't put the Muslim there because they're going to do Sharia law. Don't put the Catholic there because, you know, we just come from this place. You know, so basically you have to have our mindset of religious and civil liberty, aka being a, a Christian, a Protestant Christian, to have an office because we know you're going to protect what we're fighting for or what we fought for. Yeah, and that's exactly the point. And these are the arguments that were being used when they started to pass, you know, immigration laws in that history, because you see that the, the power of America is dependent on the people that are there. And obviously, if all these immigrants are coming in who come from despotic governments, or they said that they're not qualified or fit to rule America, because they don't come from the right governmental background, they've got a dictatorship, they've come from a, a, a royal oppression background, or, or the, you know, the priestly intolerance, the Dark Ages, Catholic mindset, like you say, and then they start putting laws in place about the immigrants that are coming in because they don't want those people, like you say, to take over the government because they don't understand how the principles of Protestant government should work, even though they themselves don't understand it fully either. But you can see exactly what you're saying. They felt threatened by all these different groups coming in and not doing it right. <laughs> and so now they've got an issue of how they're going to run this government, how they're going to set this government up. In, in a way that's going to give people freedom of religion or it's going to give people the freedom they want but as we learned I think last time we spoke about this was that they they weren't willing to extend those freedoms to others the ones they fought for themselves when they first arrived you know we've got this freedom now to exercise our religion to be Christian but we're not going to give that to anyone else because it's a threat to our status quo and this is the problem you've got that balancing those two things all the way along because you know there's going to be evil people that come in you know um, say someone arrives who's a drunkard and we say okay we can give you you know, you've got a right to get drunk if you want but or we're going to start saying no you're not allowed to drink and you're not allowed to you know stop fighting on the streets when you're in a drunken state or whatever it is we're going to start legislating against this now because we don't want this kind of behavior to be encouraged or allowed so um how much are you prepared to bear with and put up with and how much are you actually going to persecute people for when they don't agree and they don't do it your way so these are the issues facing this fledgling country that's starting to get away from all these all this wickedness in Europe and they're really challenged it's a real challenge so I want us to see I think this is going back to Natalie's question now then I know we've not got that much time left is it 10 minutes Daisy no time's up oh it's up we're already out of time and we didn't even get to the history bit which I was going to get to so next time what we'll do is we'll try and trace how from the start from 1619 is the date that the elder test gave us how it went wrong from the beginning, from 1619, when they first arrived, how they hadn't fully, you know, understood this separation of church and state. And I think the problem is like, is one that Richard touched on basically our understanding of Protestantism. So when we see Republicanism, Protestantism, already in our heads, we're mixing church and state because we're saying, yeah, a, a, a government based on Christian principles, a Christian government. <laughs> and we've been recognizing through the studies of Elder Test that that's incorrect, that we have, we have, fully got to separate those two things and give people that freedom of religion and not have a christian government and this is the argument about the constitution now was it christian or was it just got these good principles in there which were based on christian principles true christianity but it's not christian in itself because those principles can be extended to everybody else um, in the right environment so these are the things that hopefully as we trace down from 1619 through the 1700s it's very interesting what's going on there and what causes um issues and, and just to give you a highlights you know the, these the, the issues that were as part of the problem is that they don't want to be under the yoke of britain anymore and one of the reasons is because britain is heavily taxing them 
and and that taxation is crippling their economy and so they recognize they've got to throw off the yoke of britain because they want to be able to be free to produce their goods and not get overcharged for them and not have to pay all this money to Britain. And involved with that is this expansion into new territory. There's warfare between the French and the English about who owns what part of America. And so they're warring over that and trade agreements and different things. And out of that, there's also a black white issue, um, slavery issue, but all the way along, we're gonna see that there's a slavery and a religious issue going on about, you know, do we legislate Christianity? Do we say you have to go to church on Sunday, which is what they did at the beginning, and then, do we give people freedom of religion or do we legislate Christianity? And then on top of that, you've got the slavery issue, which is running all through this history from the 1600s to the 1700s, right to 1798. So we're going to trace into our history because we know the Sunday laws to do with the slavery question. And it would no see... longer be Christianity if it was legislated. Right, exactly. So because it violates the principle of Christianity, which is freedom of yeah. religion and freedom of choice. Yeah, exactly. And so it, it violates its own, the, the, the principle it's based on. So we'll see that how these two things, this, this innocence and gentleness should have been traced through from the beginning and should have been upheld those two horns, but they're broken constantly through this kind of controversy over, you know, how much rights we give to people, how much do we legislate Christianity and how much, and the slavery question. So all that we can see being traced, this breaking or this trying to set up the two horns and the breaking of them that lead to the 1850 Sunday law. So we'll look at that next time, but hopefully we can see how, how comprehensive um, you know what what freedom of religion and what freedom of civil liberty looks like and then we'll try and make some application to our time I wasn't going to get to that today anyway but if we think about all these things that constitute civil liberty you know freedom of speech freedom of privacy freedom of conscience and assembly all those things and it's it's and then start getting down to freedom of, of what you do with your own body you know in context of lbgtq and marriage and those things how we interact with each other and giving the the same rights to everyone um, then we the can pregnant perhaps, woman exactly the pregnant woman then we can relate it to the issues that we're facing today and perhaps trace in our line how those issues have always been there so let's pray let's close with prayer father in heaven we thank you for these studies that opened up our eyes to our own history we recognize the the conflict and the struggle that america had as it formed a new nation um, and the principles that the Christians went there to, to carry out that many of them didn't fully understand and that many times failed to do because of protection of our own interests and our own rights, instead of thinking about the greater good of others. Help us, Lord, to uh, recognize that struggle in our own lives individually, but also as, as a nation here in the UK even, but also in America today, how people are struggling to find their voice there their place in society and their rights and what they are and we recognize that we're in a big struggle that has always been there of how to run countries based on this principle of equality and freedom for all and liberty of conscience and this struggle has never gone away and it is the great controversy we pray that you would help us to understand it more fully that we would extend these principles to everyone we meet that we would not have an unwillingness to accept another person's beliefs that we would have that um innocence and gentleness that you want us to have as we approach people we pray they would continue to guide us as we look into these subjects of of salvational importance and that you would help us all to change our views where we have been prejudiced and um, treated people with inequality that you would forgive us lord and open our eyes and hearts and minds to walk forward as new creatures in christ that we truly might extend the freedom we enjoy as christians to all people Please be with us now, Lord, and guide us through the rest of the Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. Be Thank you, everyone, for your, your participation. It's a blessing. God bless.